This video is kindly sponsored by Keeps. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. What if I were to tell you that right now, this second, you're only able to access a tiny fraction of your true mental ability? That a well of untapped brain power is waiting just beneath the surface of your consciousness, and that one day, soon, cutting edge technology will allow you to unlock it, turning you into a genius overnight. Don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just outlining the basic premise of a widely held belief that we humans only have access to about 10% of our total brain power. You're probably already familiar with the idea, since it crops up in popular culture all the time. It's the basis of dozens of novels and several popular films. But is it actually true? To find out, I'm going to need the help of one of the greatest geniuses in history, a man with a giant hole in his brain, and a bunch of blind fish. Intrigued? Excellent. Let's begin. I want to take a moment to talk about hair loss, because I've had people close to me start to lose their hair as early as their 20s, and it's always an upsetting experience. If you're in the same boat, then you're not alone. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you've still got hair left. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication straight to you every three months so you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. There's a reason that Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and hundreds of thousands of men trust them for their hair loss prevention medication. So. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose your hair just yet. But prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results. And the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42, or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. Check it out. The idea itself is thought to have originated with the work of Harvard scientist William James, considered by many to be the father of American psychology. Whilst he never put an exact figure on it, James was a big believer that we humans are only able to tap into a small fraction of our true mental and physical abilities. And it turns out he wasn't the only one. A student of his at Harvard, by the name of Boris Cedus, was firmly of the same opinion. Boris Cedus and William James were close. So close that when Boris had a son in 1898, he named him William James Cedus after his professor and mentor, who was also the child's godfather. And the tributes didn't stop there, because Boris realised that his infant son represented an opportunity a chance to test his mentor's theories in the real world. Boris reasoned that if he raised his newborn son in just the right way, he could help that child to access that deep well of hidden potential that the vast majority of the general population is unable to. If you've been following my channel for a while, you'll already know where this story's going, because I've talked about Boris's child on here before in my video about the greatest genius of all time. William James Cedus didn't top that list, but as you can probably guess from the fact he was mentioned in a video dedicated to history's most brilliant individuals, Boris Cedus' attempt to unleash his son's hidden potential was wildly successful. As for just how successful? Well, some people claim that William James Cedus had the highest IQ in the history of mankind, somewhere between 250 and 300. That's high enough to make Einstein look like Homer Simpson after an eight pack of Duff Light. Einstein's IQ was around 160. <laughs> as well as that startling IQ, William Cedus attended Harvard at the age of 11, a record at the time, and spoke around 26 languages, one of which he'd invented himself at the age of eight. So 
Yeah, when a couple of eminent psychologists raise a child specifically to harness the parts of the mind most of us never do, the result was a boy with an apparently superhuman intellect. And I have to admit, that's some pretty compelling evidence that most of us only use 10% of our brains right there. But is that it? Case closed, end of story. Does William Cedis prove that, like old iPhones, our brains are being artificially slowed down? Well, not exactly. Because putting Cedis aside for a moment, when you think about it, it is actually kind of hard to believe that our brains are somehow perpetually underclocked. I mean, like, why? Like every other animal on the planet, we humans are a product of evolution. Now, I'm the first person to admit that evolution has a habit of working in mysterious ways. I present exhibits A, B, C, and D. But still, if there's one axiom evolution almost always seems to abide by, it's this. Use it or lose it. That is, if an organism stops using something, that adaptation will eventually degenerate until it's no longer there anymore. We see this in nature all the time. Take cave fish, for example. As the name suggests, cave fish, of which there are more than 200 species, live in caves deep underground where no sunlight ever penetrates. As a result, many of these species no longer have eyes. Evolution, by natural selection, has simply done away with them. As creepy as that may be, from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes perfect sense. Functioning eyes offer absolutely zero survival benefit to a fish living in perfect darkness. In fact, they're actually kind of a hindrance. Because growing and maintaining eyes takes up a lot of energy that could be better used elsewhere. As you may know, the brain is the most energy-hungry organ in the human body. Despite only making up around 2% of your total body weight, your brain uses around 20% of your daily energy intake. Not only that, but we pay a pretty big price for having such large brains. They make childbirth extremely dangerous, both for mother and baby. Have you ever noticed that most animals seem to have a much easier time of it than humans when it comes to giving birth? Yeah, blame your massive brain for that. By some estimates, just a few hundred years ago, before the advent of modern medicine, the lifetime risk of a woman dying in childbirth was as high as 4%. The equivalent of 1 in 25 women dying whilst giving birth. By the way, I should point out that not all animals have straightforward methods of bringing their young into the world. Female hyenas, for instance, give birth through their clitorises, sometimes referred to as a pseudopenis, causing them to rupture in the process. I know, horrific, isn't it? Sorry about that. Anyway. It simply doesn't make sense that we would dedicate so much energy to an organ, the brain, that's so massively over-engineered for no obvious reason. Meaning, if we really did only use 10% of our potential brain power, evolution would have selected for smaller, less energy-hungry brains way back in our distant past. The reason it didn't is simple. The idea that we only use 10% of our brains just isn't true. In fact, it's quite spectacularly not true. Even something as simple as opening and closing your fist involves actively using far more than 10% of your brain. And I'm afraid there isn't really any room for doubt or debate in this one. Imaging tools like PET and MRI scans can literally track our brain activity, showing us that, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that even in sleep, our brains are a hive of constant activity. Which probably shouldn't come as all that much of a surprise, really. After all, our grey matter isn't exactly short of things to do. There's all the fun stuff, obviously, like interpreting sensory data from the world around us, solving complicated problems, and coming up with terrible puns. But there's also plenty of boring maintenance work to be done. 
like monitoring and regulating the vital processes that keep us from spontaneously dying from one moment to the next. The funny thing is, despite being complete nonsense, the 10% myth is remarkably widely accepted. For example, according to a 2013 survey, 65% of Americans believe it to be true. That's more than believe in evolution. Even more alarmingly, a 2012 survey found that around 50% of primary and secondary school science teachers in the UK and the Netherlands also believe this myth to be true. And they should definitely know better. Of course, the media has a lot to answer for with this one. As I mentioned at the start of the video, the 10% myth crops up all over the place in popular culture. It was the basis for the film Limitless, starring Bradley Cooper, and it fulfilled a similar role in Lucy, starring Scarlett Johansson. That one was particularly egregious, because the character tasked with explaining the whole 10% of the brain premise was played by Morgan Freeman. And it's a well-known fact that human beings are pre-programmed to believe everything that man says. But it isn't all Morgan Freeman's fault. Part of the reason the myth gained strength, particularly in the early days, is because neuroscience was very much in its infancy at the time. And there was a lot of uncertainty about which bits of the brain did what. As you've probably already noticed, the human brain is a pretty remarkable thing. This one odd little organ that looks a bit like a mouldy cauliflower is responsible for the world's tallest skyscrapers, for men walking on the moon, for Harry Potter, aeroplanes, microchips, blue tack, and, well, everything. If you were to take whatever device you're watching this video on right now and shove a metal spike through the middle of it, there's a fairly good chance it wouldn't be much good for watching YouTube videos on afterwards. The human brain, on the other hand, is much more resilient. Allow me to introduce you to Phineas Gage. In 1858, Phineas had an accident at work where a meter-long iron rod was blasted through his skull with such force it exited through the other side and landed 25 meters away. Despite this catastrophic Final Destination-style injury, Gage survived. In fact, he didn't just survive, he recovered. And hey, if you can blow giant holes in the brain with relatively little impact on overall cognitive function, it isn't such a huge leap of logic to assume that large parts of the brain don't really do all that much, which was pretty much the view of many early neurologists. These days, we know better. Whilst Gage did make a full recovery, well, until he died from an almost certainly related epileptic fit 12 years later, reports from the time show that he did suffer some fairly dramatic changes to his personality. And since the iron rod that pierced his skull is thought to have pretty much obliterated his left frontal lobe, a part of the brain containing the prefrontal cortex, which controls, amongst other things, emotions and inhibitions, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the idea that we only use 10% of our brains is definitely not accurate. Meaning there will never be some kind of limitless style magic pill that turns us all into superhumans overnight. But wait a second, what about the strange case of William James Cedars? Isn't it a hell of a coincidence that the originators of this weird 10% of the brain myth managed to raise a child who, some claim, had the highest IQ in the history of mankind? Well, yes, it kind of is. But then, there are a few caveats to William's story that I should probably mention. The first is that some of those claims made about him are a little controversial. For example, there are conflicting reports about just how high his IQ was and it's generally accepted that his family were prone to exaggerate some of his more impressive feats of intellect. His sister once told a journalist that her brother spoke every language on earth, which seems unlikely. Cedus did indeed attend Harvard at the age of 11, 
But don't forget, his godfather was one of the university's most influential professors at the time, so it's safe to say that probably helped. Having said all that, whilst we can't be sure exactly how brilliant William Cedis was, what isn't in question is that he was brilliant. Even if his godfather did use his influence to get William accepted into Harvard at such a young age, there's no doubt he wowed his professors when he got there. In his first year, just before he turned 12, William delivered such a stunning lecture to the Harvard Mathematical Club on four-dimensional bodies. And it wasn't long before leading figures at the university were predicting that William would go on to become one of the greatest mathematicians of the century. So whilst modern neuroscience tells us that Boris Cedis and William James can't possibly have helped William Cedis tap into some hidden brain power not accessible to the rest of us, it does seem like they managed to do something. And here, perhaps, we come to the kind of secret truth that lies behind this odd 10% of your brain power myth. You see, Boris Cedis and William James never claimed that humans only use 10% of their brain power. What they actually believed was that most of us only ever achieve a tiny fraction of our true potential. And on that front, they were almost certainly correct. Think about all the things in your life that compete for your attention. Social media, the internet in general, TV, school or work, family, friends, hobbies, hopes, fears, dreams, romance. Now, just imagine all the things you could learn and the skills you could master if you cut all of that out of your life and spent every waking hour studying, training and practicing various different things. With that kind of dedication, over the span of a human life, how many languages could you learn? How many instruments could you master? How many subjects could you become an expert in? The human brain doesn't really seem to have a limit on its ability to learn new things. The only thing holding it back is our willingness to dedicate the time to feeding it. Whilst the exact methods used in raising William Cedis are mostly unknown, we do know that his father Boris and William James designed a rigorous forced learning program for William to follow from practically the day he was born. Most of us spent our childhoods playing with toys and picking our noses. William Cedis? He spent his training to become a genius. But before you go emptying your life of all distractions to take up studying 24 hours a day, I should probably point out that William's story is also a cautionary one. This was a boy who never really got a proper childhood, who was sent to university when he was still just a kid, and whose parents seemed determined to raise a gifted son, no matter the cost. And it turns out that whilst all of that might give you a good shot at Harvard, it isn't all that great for your mental health. In the end, none of the predictions about Cedis' spectacular future in mathematics came true. He didn't make any grand discoveries or solve any of mankind's long-held problems. He didn't dazzle the world with brilliant proofs or leaps of logic. In fact, he didn't do much of anything besides obsessively collect streetcar transfers. He shunned academia altogether working menial jobs that required no intelligence whatsoever and having at least one run-in with the law before dying of a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of just 46. So yeah, there's no truth to the rumour that we humans only ever use 10% of our brains. And whilst there is some truth to the idea that few of us ever reach our full potential, maybe that's not such a bad thing. After all, Life isn't actually one giant competition to see who can achieve the most stuff, even if it kind of seems like it is sometimes. Thanks for watching.